The iconic yellow school bus. In America, they really haven't changed much. Heck, most states still do not require seatbelts to restrain the little monsters inside. But quietly, a revolution is happening. All the major school bus manufacturers are rolling out battery electric versions of these people movers. In this video, I'm going to give an overview of what's being offered and give out grades to see if they pass the test. Let's start off with something easy, the body and chassis of these e-buses. I'll give them a B minus. If you couldn't already tell, electric school buses are based on the same body and chassis as the combustion engine models. There are four basic bus sizes in North America. Type A are the short buses based on a van. Type B are typically a shorter version of a type C, which is the most common type. And then we have type D buses that have a flat front and allows for a few extra rows of seating for more capacity. It's a good thing that they use the same body and chassis as the combustion engine versions. They're proven to work, and using the same parts helps to reduce cost and investment. Now, I gave the minus because I really would prefer to see them try and improve the aerodynamics for better efficiency, put some effort into rethinking that old design, as a side note, some buses have their bumpers painted a bright blue to let the moms and dad know that their kids are riding on a very special electric vehicle. And I kind of dig it. I think it just should be mandatory. I'm going to compare five different Type C buses to their diesel equivalent and one Type D bus affectionately called the Beast. You'll see why. Powertrain gets an A. Now I know what you're thinking. Ah, that's woke bullshit. No way an EV powertrain can get the job done. To that I say, let's look at what their job is. The average route for a school bus in the U.S. is only about 30 miles, a morning run and an afternoon run. That's 60 to 70 miles a day. I guess I never thought about how far school buses drive. The number doesn't sound too difficult. Now that's an average, but the data says that well over 90% of the use cases would be covered by a range of 77 miles or 154 miles combined per day. Let's see how they do. Most buses have a range of between 100 to 150 miles. But of course, with range like fuel economy, your miles may vary. In hot or cold weather, you'll need to make the driver and passengers more comfortable. That will affect the range. More about that later. And you don't want to cut it too close. So you'll want a bus with more range than you think you'll need. On the other hand, buses go back to their depot in between their morning and afternoon runs giving them an opportunity to add some electrons while they're sitting there. Let's talk about how to charge them. They can DC fast charge, just not at ridiculously fast speeds. Good though. This would require the school to install high power DC fast chargers, which are very expensive, or they try to find public DC charging that can accommodate their large bodies. Both are difficult options. If you have shorter routes, Fleets like to slow charge them using AC level 2 charging. Level 2 chargers are very affordable, and they don't take much electrical work to set up a whole bank of them. Just let them charge overnight when the buses aren't being used, they have plenty of time, and electricity is cheapest. Many of the buses I've seen in operation seem to favor a middle ground. They DC charge, but at a lower power level than public fast charging let's say in the 30 kilowatt range. So faster than AC level two, but it's less expensive hardware to install and to operate than the high powered fast chargers you see out in the public. So it's a good compromise. Now, what if your school district has one of those exceptionally long routes? They do exist. There's two ways to look at this. Mike's philosophy is we should address the low hanging fruit first. Schools that get an electric school bus should put it in use on their shorter routes and then grow from there as you get more knowledge. Keep using diesel buses for those exceptionally long routes and we'll get to them later as the technology improves. Green Power, on the other hand, said, F you, Mike. Wow, there's, there's a lot of foul language in this video. Anyway, Green Power doubled the range of their beast to about 300 miles. They did this by doubling the size of the battery and the cost. We'll, we'll talk about cost later. Electric buses and commercial trucks of this medium duty size have gravitated towards a fairly common battery module design 
allowing them to add capacity and range for different models. Here are a couple of examples from different manufacturers. It packages neatly between the frame rails. This helps make repair or replacement a little bit more universal and potentially allow for battery swapping if that ever takes off in trucks. Power is not typically a problem for electric vehicles. Their motors develop torque instantly, so they feel very responsive. When you compare it to a diesel bus, they're all comparable and get the job done. Of the many case studies being promoted by the bus manufacturers, this one from Colorado highlights their experience in cold weather and high altitudes. Combustion engines lose power, efficiency, and they have increased emissions at higher altitudes, although diesel engines are turbocharged to help reduce that impact. An electric vehicle, however, suffers no such losses, and the thinner air actually just improves the aerodynamics. I spoke to a sales representative from one of the manufacturers, and they claim that they calibrate the accelerator pedal to limit the performance of the bus. Basically, they don't want drivers to accelerate too hard, causing the students to snap back and fly around. Most of their time is spent at low speed, so ludicrous acceleration is not a requirement. Temperature affects the range of electric vehicles because they need to cool off or heat up the passengers and regulate the temperature of the battery. Let's talk about hot weather first. Currently, not all diesel school buses have air conditioning. It's rare in northern states except for special needs buses. In southern states, it's more common, but definitely not standard. Electric buses essentially run that same compressor with an electric motor that's powered by the main battery. So that's how range is affected. In cold weather, the combustion engine vehicles have an easy time heating up the cabin because the engine generates lots of waste heat. It's a sign of inefficiency of the engine. But in the cold, that waste heat can be repurposed to warm up the passengers. With electric vehicles, there are a couple of different methods to keep people warm. Some school buses circulate hot fluid through radiators in the bus. Basically, they're taking that same combustion engine system and making it work for an EV use electricity to heat the fluid and circulate it. The better method is to use essentially an electric space heater to blow hot air. It's a more efficient way of operating. The even better way would be to use a heat pump. It's kind of like an air conditioning system for cold air, but run in reverse. Tesla and some other EV manufacturers use them today, and eventually they'll become more common. Here's some interesting data collected on electric school buses running in Alaska and Minnesota. The data shows that as temperature drops, so does the range, up to a 33% decrease. Now, fleet managers need to take that into consideration when planning out the routes. The same chart shows a smaller dip in hot weather. One method of addressing cold weather performance is preconditioning. When the bus is still plugged in at the yard, the heating system gets turned on well before leaving to start their morning route. This way, the heating system is not draining the high-voltage battery because the bus is plugged in. The driver is able to decide if they want to heat or cool the entire bus or just their area where they're sitting. They also offer electrically heated seats and steering wheel for the bus driver if they desire that. Another strategy for heating is to use an optional fuel-fired heater. It uses propane, gas, or diesel fuel to heat the cabin. Yes, that does produce CO2 emissions and other emissions, but it's only a little and it's only used on very cold days. Overall, I give the electric school buses a B- minus for comfort. The driver and the passengers are kept comfortable, but range does get reduced. B is for brakes. Electric school buses have a traditional air brake system for safety, but they also have regenerative brakes. Regen helps to recover some of the energy rather than just waste it as heat in the brakes. Some buses allow the driver to adjust the level of regen braking, and even at the highest level, it's not as aggressive as you will find in a Tesla car. Fleet managers are often concerned about the drivers not being used to regenerative braking, so they prefer to have a way to adjust the level of regen based on the driver's preference. For safety, I give it a passing grade. The bus itself, the body, and the chassis are common with the combustion engine buses. Crashworthiness seats and seat belts, if equipped, are the same. By the way, most states do not require seat belts. Their testing has shown that the 
padded seats are sufficient to prevent serious injury in a head-on crash, and the kids are likely to misuse seatbelts. In rollover accidents and higher speed crashes, however, the results are different. Electric school buses are heavier, which can be a negative if you're trying to quickly come to a stop, but it can be a positive as the batteries are at frame level or lower, giving it a very low center of gravity. This would make it less likely to roll over. The big question on safety is the energy storage, battery versus a fuel tank. Electric vehicle batteries can have a thermal event. They can catch on fire. The National Fire Prevention Association published a report a couple of years ago that conclusively determined that electric vehicle fires need to be studied more. You know, it, it's frustrating. It sounds strange that even NHTSA doesn't have good enough data to say whether or not they're a higher or lower risk than a gas or diesel engine. You may have seen something floating around online saying that they are far safer, but that little meme has largely been debunked. As for combustion engines, they have and they do catch fire, diesel, gas, and compressed natural gas. When they do catch fire, they propagate rapidly, while battery EVs experience a thermal runaway that develops slowly, allowing the passengers to safely escape. Additionally, there are two different battery chemistries used in EVs today. Nickel-cobalt-rich batteries are energy-dense, so it gives them a longer range. And then there's lithium-iron-phosphate batteries that use cheaper materials. They're less energy-dense, but they're also far less prone to thermal events. All in all, there's nothing to suggest that a battery EV school buses are less safe Plus, diesel engine exhaust is known to cause breathing problems by emitting particulate matter, and the exhaust has been designated as a carcinogen. If I were a teacher, I would always give an extra credit question. I just think they're fun. Electric school buses get extra credit for V to G, vehicle to grid. If you're a regular of this channel, you probably know what that is. It's being promoted as a feature that will revolutionize EV ownership, allowing you to sell energy from the battery back to the utility company when demand is high and prices are highest. Personally, I'm a little skeptical of this for personal use vehicles. Most Americans want as much energy in their car as possible. It's gonna take a lot to convince them to give it up. But school buses, they may be a game changer. And it's all because of the duck curve. It's a term used to describe electricity demand. Taking a look, utilities could sure use more electricity capacity later in the afternoon. If you have a school bus with a big battery, once the kids are back home after the school day, the district could sell back electricity during peak time and then recharge overnight at a cheaper rate. And best of all, electricity usage is at its highest in the summer. And what are school buses doing in the summer? Nothing. Just like the kids, they're doing nothing useful all summer. This is called a virtual peaker plant. To do this, you'll need the CCS plug, another reason why you see so many DC charging infrastructure for these school buses versus AC. This could generate money for the schools. How much? Honestly, I've seen numbers all over the place, from a, a few hundred per bus to over $10,000 a year. More pilot programs need to be run and are being run to see how much potential there is. The U.S. government has allocated $5 billion to help school districts switch from diesel to electric buses. The EPA has a website that tracks where the money is going. I'll put a link to that in the notes. You can see what districts have won grants near you. If you live in Wyoming, nobody wants to change. Conservative South Carolina and Georgia, however, they're along for the ride. Perhaps it has something to do with Bluebird manufacturing in Georgia. Thomas Built is in North Carolina. And Proterra is in South Carolina. They recently declared bankruptcy, but they sold off their battery manufacturing operations to Volvo Trucks, and they plan to cash in on this opportunity. All the bus manufacturers are hosting events to bring in school leaders to help explain the process and help them with their applications. They want to make sure schools can navigate the bureaucracy of the process. So how much do they cost? Their grade for economics, they get... An incomplete. And maybe that's being kind. If you think they deserve an F, say so in the notes, because here's why. A Type-C bus costs about $100,000 for a diesel version. 
That's about the same price as a medium duty straight truck. Makes sense. IC Bus, for example, is owned by the same company as International Truck, so there's a good deal of component sharing between these two medium duty trucks. International makes an electric version of their medium duty called the EMV. The price of that is about $100,000 more than the diesel version. That cost delta gets reduced by U.S. federal incentives for commercial vehicles, and some states are offering incentives on top of that. So the difference gets smaller, and it's offset by the reduced fuel and maintenance costs. But for a battery electric bus, the cost delta is larger. They run about $300,000. Why? My best guess is lobbying. The grants for electric school buses are more generous than the commercial truck program. You can guess that the bus manufacturers worked hard to convince the right people in Washington. So in my opinion, and this is just an opinion, electric school buses are more expensive than their commercial truck siblings because the federal incentives allow them to charge more. Don't hate the player, hate the game. As for maintenance costs, pilot programs have shown that the costs can easily be cut in half. Energy costs, electricity versus diesel fuel, the savings are even more impressive, saving thousands a year. I'll put links to some of these studies in the notes. Electric buses are new, batteries are slowly ramping up, and volumes are currently low. So it is expensive for manufacturers to make these things. As the technology matures, expect their costs to come down. But when will those costs come down? Probably when the clean bus program expires at the end of 2026, and then they have to compete with each other on price. School board meetings used to be really boring events held in the library. Now they've turned into something different. But what the hell, reach out to your local school board members and ask them if they've considered the benefits of an electric school bus. Grant applications are being accepted, which can lead to a free bus with lower operating costs. There are lots of resources online to help schools navigate this process. They're made in America. Lion Electric, which was a Quebecois company, they do final assembly in Illinois. The Chinese company BYD, they do final bus assembly in California. Electric school buses are high tech. Maybe it gets the little boys and the girls more interested in STEM, and they're cleaner. Reputable studies have shown that even when EVs get their electricity from the dirtiest forms of generation, they produce less CO2 over their lifetime. And the kids won't be breathing in that diesel smoke. Class dismissed. Thanks for watching.